you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Good morning, afternoon, evening, Long Street, wherever you are. I hope you are having a phenomenal day. I know I am. Actually, I'm going to make it a phenomenal day. Actually, to be honest, it's six o'clock in the morning (laughs) as I'm recording this, which I love it because I get up early, but I'm going to make today great. All right. Before we dig into how to innovate in a flash, I want to let you know some exciting news. We are, actually, we have officially launched our corporate IQE certification program to the public. Yay to you. So we've been running this beta program, I guess you could call it, with a select few clients for the past year and a half, and it's been phenomenal. So if you are a leader that wants to make innovation a priority with your team or a leader responsible for building a culture of innovation, if you want access to the best tools to find solutions to your biggest challenges and going after your opportunities, or if you're a leader that wants to up your professional game, be a stronger leader, bring your skills to the table, stand out, this is a fantastic certification for you. You'll learn all the ins and outs of unlocking your strong innovation strengths, the things that get you the competitive advantage, and unlocking the everyday innovators on your team, tapping into the power of diversity of thinking on your teams, and have the tools for all of you to lead innovative conversations and ideas daily. So if you want to learn more, reach out. We'd love to talk to you about it. Just email us or go to our website to learn more. Click on the team training page. Okay. On to today's interview with Roger Firestein. I really appreciated this interview because we did some live work on air. So you could actually see how the tools he was talking about, how to actually implement them. Because as you all know, nothing bothers me more than like talking in these platitudes and in like, you know, hyperboles and like in theory, this should work. We dug in today to make it actually work so that you could see it in action. It is so cool. And we discussed solving the real problem, not the superficial one, and why innovation is for everyone. So Roger L. Firestein, PhD, has trained more people to lead the creative process than anyone else in the world. He is a senior faculty at the Center for Creativity and Change Leadership at SUNY Buffalo, president of Innovation Resources, Inc., and author of the new book, Create in a Flash. All right, let's do this. Roger, thank you so much for joining me today. I have a feeling um, you and I are going to have a very lively conversation. I agree, Tamara. It's going to be a great session. So tell us, Roger, what's one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? Well, one thing that people would be surprised to learn about me is that I work cattle on a farm for fun. And here's the story behind this. I grew up on a farm uh, in near Greeley, Colorado. And I left the farm in 1978 to come out to Buffalo, New York, to study creativity and innovation at the Center for Applied Imagination, the only place in the world where you get a Master of Science degree in creativity studies. And at the time, it was like, I didn't want to have anything to do with the farm. And then a number of years ago, I ran into a fellow who uh, works a cattle farm, who owns a cattle farm about uh, 38 miles from here. And we became good friends. I went through some challenging times. And I, uh, I, I called him up one day and I said, Phil, you need some help. And so I went out and I helped him out. And ever since then, I go out there about every two to three weeks just to work on the farm, to drive a tractor, to deal with the cattle. There's about 400 head of cattle. And I call it farm therapy because what it does is it goes away from the usual day-to-day things that are going on. And I get to do something where I get to see the actual results, see a field plowed, uh, see changes, uh, some real tangible results. And so that's, it's farm therapy and I work cattle for fun. You know, it's interesting that you, it's a great story and interesting that you mentioned that because I was just talking to someone the other day about the fact that I really crave doing something with my hands, like welding or I don't know, building with wood or I don't, I mean, I'm probably not even using the right language, but you know what I mean? Because I do think there's something really uh, satisfying and engaging and it just, it, it engages your brain in a different way that you just don't use. And everything we do is so digital these days. That I just um, crave that tangibleness of it all. 
you know, Tamara, and I get this feeling when it's time I need to do farm therapy, and I talk about this in the book, Creating a Flash, I get a little antsy, you know, my writing gets a little stale, you know, it's like um, teaching at a university, it's get a little antsy, and I just need to get out there, and I think it does a couple of things. First, um, you know, I'm working on this tractor, I'm doing stuff that Phil tells me to do. I don't have to make decisions. Mm. The other thing, that's as nice you break. mentioned, yeah, that's the thing, yeah. The other thing is that there's a real tangible result. If I go out and bush hog a field, which is to knock down all these weeds so the cattle can graze I see this really rugged field before and this very smooth field afterwards and there's something about that you know bringing in a hundred bales of hay in a day there's something about that at the end of the day you're exhausted but you see the tangible results and I think in our business much of the time you know in education and when you're when you're working with clients and stuff you don't see that tangible right. result right away a lot of satisfaction in that yeah I could totally see that um, thank you for sharing that so I actually, you know, we're talking innovation creativity today. I wanted to actually back up and talk to you to start with, really to set the foundation, mm -hmm. your definition of creativity. Because I think that's a word, and you know, I play in the innovation space, it's the same thing with that word. Sure. You ask 10 people what it means and you get 50 different answers. And oh, yeah, and I think creativity in particular actually comes with a little bit of baggage. People think, oh, it's artsy, it's you know, painting and doing photography and dance maybe um but your definition of creativity has the combination of the words novel and useful so tell us more about your definition and why those words yes and, and that's not really my definition it's the definition of the creativity scholar morris stein and what he did was he looked at all the definitions that were out there and there are as you're aware about 60 or 70 different definitions out there for what creativity is and he boiled it down to the very essence of what creativity is and he believed it's novel that's useful and so i think all of us would agree and there's different levels of novelty and usefulness um right. i think all of us would agree that for something to be called creative it has to be novel right yeah. and uh but so uh, so for example if you take a look at a smartphone when they first came out they were both novel and they were useful and tomorrow i don't know if you remember this do you remember the pet rock of course I do. I'm a Gen Of course. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Novel, not very useful. All right? <laughs> you know what? That's how I feel about the Chia Pet, and it's still here somehow. Oh, that's my next one. Oh, I can't believe it. This is the next one in my notes. It's a Chia Pet. Novel, not very useful. I no. can't believe that you said that. <laughs> no, I, just, I went right. That's where I went right to the Chia Chia Chia. Let me ask you about novel for a second, though. Let me dig into that. Because I think people, when they hear novel, think it needs to be this new to the world, blue skies. My God, this is such a breakthrough. And when I think about the iPhone, kind of the example you gave, mm -hmm. it, that what was novel is taking a technology that existed and making it user-friendly, right? The, mm -hmm. What Apple did wasn't create the technology that hadn't existed. They repackaged right. it in a way that made it useful. So... I just wanted to get some clarity around the word novel because I do think it in some ways scares people to think, oh my God, I have to come up with something new, never been thought of ever in this world. Yes. Well, let's take a look at novel in two ways, incremental and disruptive. Mm. So if we take a look at incremental novelty, this is making a system or a process or a procedure safer, more efficient, more effective. That's very creative, but it might not be disruptively novel. And so disruptive novel is where people are really kind of focusing on, oh, I, I can't come up with this great new idea. I can't come up with this thing that changes the world. Well, um, creativity is just important to make those small changes, particularly in organizations, uh, a whole bunch of small changes can really make a difference regarding right. these and those sorts of things. And I think, you know, the small changes, you know, uh, tomorrow, as we talked about, they kind of get a lot of bad, they, they don't get the press, yeah. but the big stuff yeah. gets. And I think it also has to do with the definition, you know, uh, and we can go to that in a minute if you want to talk about that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, one of the things we talked about earlier is how people sabotage or hinder their creativity. And I was, as I was thinking about this, I really believe it has a lot to do with how we define creativity mm -hmm. or innovation. And most people don't think they're creative or most people don't think they're innovative. And that's why I like the work of the researchers, Ron Baghetto and James Kaufman. And what they've done is they've taken creative, all right, and they've taken it down in what they call their 4C model of creativity. And so for one of the four C's is the big C. And, you know, those are the Einsteins, the, uh, the uh, Charles Darwins, the Grace Hoppers, the Hel Helen Kellers. 
Then there's the little C, and this is the kind of creativity that we do every day. You know, in talking about the farm, this is fixing a piece of farm machinery with a, you know, some wire and tape. Or if you look at your refrigerator, making a delicious meal out of the leftovers. Or if you're my mother, making a quilt out of scraps of cloth that's absolutely beautiful. That's little C. Right. Then there's the mini C, which is what's, what children focus on. This is the discovery. And when a new idea is born, that's oftentimes a mini C, seeing the world in a different way. And then the fourth C is what they call pro C, which is professional creators that aren't quite eminent yet. So it would be people like uh, uh, musical arrangers, uh, directors who, uh, who, who uh, direct uh, plays, those sorts of things, interior designers that make a, make a house beautiful. So I really like that model because what we often tend to do is we tend to put ourselves up against the big C. Right. And how can you compare with an Einstein? Well, of course yeah. you're not going to think you're creative. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think, um, right, I think that's a big hindrance to to creativity is thinking that it has to be this, you know, blue sky, mm-hmm. you know. And and the reality with is actually, let me back up. Someone uh, said it to me best. Actually, his name is Dr. Rex Young, and he's a neuro. Um, neuroscientist, I guess is how mm-hmm. you're supposed to say it. And he said, you know, creativity is common, genius is rare. And we confuse it. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And I think that kind of to Beautiful. what you're saying is, you know, these people like um, Steve Jobs and mm-hmm. I'm going to put Beyonce in there, like musical artists yeah. too. Um, you know, I think they're in a lot of ways, they're geniuses and they're dialed up in creativity, yes, but there's a lot of other things going on and we confuse the two very easily. We certainly do. Yeah. We also confuse creativity with intelligence and what we know about creativity is that there are people that are highly intelligent that are not necessarily that creative and people with moderate right. amounts of intelligence are incredibly creative, yeah. So, so here's yeah. what's interesting about that that I discovered in some research recently, which you probably already know, but for our listeners, is actually there's two different structures in our brain for intelligence and innovation or creativity. So mm-hmm. they're not actually the same. I think of one as super highways and the other one is more like loose side roads. That would be creativity, obviously. Mm. But that to me was really exciting because I thought, oh, thank God, because I sucked at school. So I'm obviously not very bright, but I can be creative. Woo! <laughs> well, yeah, and, and then the research on that is what is called the threshold concept. In other words, creativity and intelligence are moderate rela- related up to a, an IQ of about 100, 120. That's just a little over average. Yeah. After an IQ of 120, all bets are off, you yeah. know. And so, and so it's like, you know, isn't that marvelous? I mean, and the other thing is, you know, school is one thing, but there's so much other parts of life where you can be right. creative in, you know. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So tell me other hindrances. What else are we doing, do you think, to, to sabotage our own creativity? So one, as you just said, which I think is a huge one, is we keep trying to compare or try to be like the Beyonce's and, you know, Elon Musk's of the world, which then shuts us down because we're not them. So what else? Mm-hmm. Well, I think the other thing is is um, how we foster our own creativity. And I'm of the school that you can become deliberately more creative, that you can learn the skills to be more creative. we got tons of research on this, as you know, and that's really where I come from. And so at a really basic level, one of the things that I find is that way people pin to their creativity is that they come up with an idea and they immediately judge it and they stop. Right? Yep. And so what we recommend to do is to just is to what we call defer judgment. Don't judge your ideas for a while, come up with 10 or 15 or 20 ideas and then evaluate those ideas, but don't try to judge and generate at the same time. And one of the favorite analogies around that is, is you don't try to drive a car with your gas, with your foot on the gas and your foot on the brakes at the same time. It doesn't, it's not, good for the car and you don't get very far. So it's the alternation of generating ideas and then evaluating those ideas. I think that's the number one thing. Yeah. So let's dig into that a little bit. What are some, Mm -hmm. some ways that you have found that help you get over that or, or maybe create that? I don't know if it's a daily practice, but exercising that part of your brain and your ability more so that you can work your way into being stronger. You know, I think the real essence of this is making connections. And I mean, if you take a look at the history of creativity, what it is is connecting things in a different way than people had thought of before. And there's a wonderful story about this, about how the Nike trainer was originally invented. And the idea came from Bill Bowerman was trying to find a way for his athletes to rip the new AstroTurf, artificial turf, without the the spikes in their shoes. And he'd been working on this problem for months Uh, He and his wife are having breakfast one morning. She's making waffles. 
he sees a waffle on the waffle iron, essentially grabs a waffle iron, takes it to his lab, and that's the innovation that led to the Nike waffle trainer, making those connections. But he had to wait for that, all right? What we can do in creativity is we can deliberately help people to make those connections. It's a technique called forced connections. The other thing is, is that, I mean, the invention, the, the inspiration around the pacemaker was a hazard flashing light. Uh, the inventor of that was coming home from the lab one time he'd been working on this, see these flashing hazard lights with electricity. So it's connecting things in a different way than people have seen before. And people can do that all the time. I mean, ideas are everywhere. You know, so say you're, you're working on a particular problem and I'm sitting here in my office and, you know, maybe I'm working on a problem on how to deliver a seminar more effectively and I have a model rocket here on my desk that I built when I was 12 years old. So I might ask, well, what ideas might I get for this model rocket for making this seminar more interesting? Well, maybe people build their planes in it and they throw them around or or, you know, we, we streamline it so it goes really fast or, or we use a, a, an aeronautical or a rocket theme for that. And those are some ideas that just came up with right off the top of my head. And the more you make these connections, the better you get at it. And so look at the problem, look at something completely unrelated, force a connection, and then see what new ideas develop from that. And that's my go-to tool for creativity. So I love that. That's a tool. Thank you. One of the stories I've heard, and I actually have never proven or disproven it, so tell me if you know if it's actually okay. Weird. But I like it, it sure. works for what we're talking about, so I'm going to use it anyway. Um, is that Southwest was trying to speed up turnaround time at the gate because, you know, okay. if that's slow, that delays everything through the day. Mm -hmm. And so, but instead of looking at other airplanes, so other people, companies, processes in their industry, which is what most of us tend to do, which gets us to be very myopic because we're just looking at people doing the same right. thing as us. They went and said, well, who else has speed issues? And that led them to the indie pits where right, they've got to be in and out of the pits in a flash. So I mm -hmm. thought that was interesting. And I love that. I love the reason I love that story. And if someone is listening from Southwest, can you call me and tell me if that's true or not? Because I like it. <laughs> yes, please do. Yeah, I love Southwest. Yeah. <laughs> What's not cool about Southwest? Um, right. But, but what I love about it is it's a very simple question of who else has the same problem I have. So if I don't know where to look, it's a really easy way to go outside of my field um, without being so random that I don't know how to pull it back. Yes, yes. And it's really interesting, too. When I do idea labs where we bring people together to work on specific problems in an organization, and I'm sure you've had this experience as well, people will say, well, we're working on a technical problem, so we need to get all the technical experts yeah, right. in the room to work on the problem. I say, well, if the technical experts haven't solved it, why have more of those right. folks in here, right? <laughs> and I get this look. It's like, uh -huh. <laughs> It's like, so what you need, get people that have a different perspective, you know, people that don't know what can't be done, and then that really really spices it up but yeah <laughs> um, you've said a couple things i just want to highlight because i think they're important uh -huh. on Long street one is you had said uh, a minute ago about don't basically innovate and analyze at the same time which is something okay. I, I i believe in and talk about quite a bit because we do we shut, we shut down our own innovation our brain can't do both at the same time to your point mm -hmm. gas and break um but but i think the other thing that you said in there that is important to pull out is you know when you have that quantity of ideas if you let yourself go wide first and then give yourself a break before you analyze. Don't you find too that that gives your brain an opportunity to mull it over and even make those ideas better? Because so, I don't know if you find this, but sometimes I find that, like, I, I get a, 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 a creative idea, I write it down, and if I actually give myself permission to just let it sit for a bit, I can actually make it better. But we don't even do that, we try to rush to analysis. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> uh, first off, we have some research, and this is kind of based on some of my own experiences, that after people participate in an idea-generating session where they're working on a particular challenge where they say they've come up with 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 ideas, they can do that in a very short period of time. We can talk about that if you'd like a little bit later. Then give them a pause. Give them a time to just get away. And so if you have the luxury to do that and you're doing a seminar or something like that, have that, uh, you know, so that people end the day with something like that. Yeah. And then what I tell people, as you've experienced, write those ideas down when they come to you because they're going to come to you because you've stirred it up in your subconscious or all, where all that stuff is working. Then come back the next day and add those refined ideas to it. It's extraordinary. The ideas tend to be a little bit of a different quality, as you mentioned, a little bit more well-developed, yeah. a little richer because you've had the time That's to simply marinate on it. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful.
Yeah. yeah, richer is a great way to say it. It's not necessarily that they're better. They're just, there's more to them for sure. Yeah, a little bit more detail to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I really like that. The other thing that you were, I, I think came out of the stories you were telling about um, Nike and whatnot is they were actually thinking about it in the time they were doing the work. And sometimes I find that we relegate or silo, I guess I should say, innovation or creativity to um, that 3 p.m. brainstorm with the scented markers. That's always my favorite example. Mm. And not that oh. I think about scented markers or corporate crack, watermelon's my favorite. <laughs> Right? That's, that's not when we're doing the work. And the stories that you shared, really those flashes of insight. I mean, the waffle iron was in the kitchen, but it's because it wasn't in a conference room that he came up with. No. It was in the field doing the work. And I think I'd love to get your perspective on this. It seems like sometimes we think that the only time that creativity should happen is when we schedule it in that meeting. I am so glad you asked this question because when I begin seminars and workshops, I, I give people this scenario. I say, I'd like you to imagine a problem that you're working on and it's been nagging you for a while and you haven't yeah. solved it. But then the idea came to you and where did that idea come to you? And there's basically three places, four places where it comes to you. One, while somebody's driving, okay? Yep. Two, yep. while they're working out or doing a run. Three, while they're falling asleep or four, while they're taking a bath or a shower, all right? Yeah. And it's because that judgmental mind has just been sort of like lulled down. You're paying yeah. attention to something else and the idea bubbles up. And so just, and then the key is just be ready to capture that idea, you know, put it into your smartphone, write it down, and then you can go back to it later. But no, it's, 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 you know, you can get a, a good quantity of ideas out in a, in an idea generating session in a, in a, in an organization. And I wouldn't recommend three o'clock early in the morning. It's usually a little better, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but then take a break, you know, yeah. and, and the, and the quantity of the, and the ideas is going to be so much better. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm with you. I believe very strong. I mean, I do, you know, workshops too, and, and mm -hmm. yours are fantastic. And I believe very strongly in pull, bringing people together to really focus on it. I just mm -hmm. don't like it when it, that's the only time people have a way. So I love what you said about just capturing them all when you have them. Because that, yes. that is not enough. Um, I, I want to dig into something that's actually in your book title. So your book is Create in a Flash, a Leader's Recipe for Breakthrough Innovation. Um, I want to talk about in a flash because that's the part that really caught my attention. Why is that in the title? Well, thank you for that. And most people think that creativity or innovation or coming up with a new idea has to be something laborious. You have to yeah. sweat over this. You know, you have to work on it for a long time. And there are records and, and, and accounts in the field where people have spent years working on a challenge and the idea eventually comes to them. But what we talk about, them, there's a myth around there is that it takes a lot of time to come up with an innovative idea or a creative idea. And it goes back to what I talked about earlier about being deliberately creative. Um, my job is to train people to use the behaviors that help them to come up with more ideas in a much shorter period of time. So if you're training some of these creative problem solving techniques, like what we talk about in the book, deferring judgment, striving for quantity, making connections, you put together a trained group of that of about seven to eight folks. And in 10 minutes, it's not uncommon to come up with about 100 ideas. Yeah. Now, yeah. that's just half of it, as you know, all right? Yeah. Uh, the other half of it is sorting through those ideas and finding and developing those ideas. And so we talk about in, in, the, uh, um, in, in the website, we, uh, uh, we have 20 videos that accompany the book. We actually show you how to select ideas and refine them and build them. Um, but as you know, it's, it's, it's a good idea generating session. It's not leaving the room with a bunch of ideas up on the wall. It's leaving with some action plans right. and some next steps. Mm -hmm. so, so, and then by being, being deliberate about that and deliberately separating the evaluation of I, the generation of ideas from their evaluation. And so um, the other thing is I tell groups and, and folks too is that if you're spending 10 or 15 minutes generating ideas, you need to spend about the next 45 minutes to an hour selecting and evaluating those ideas because right. creativity comes in the selection as well. So talk to me a little bit about, I think you're gonna have a lot to say on this, on two things. One is the importance of quantity on the front end and the, I don't know how to say this without sounding like a jerk, but let me just say it. The recognition <laughs> that some, 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 many ideas don't need to go forward, shouldn't go forward. Um, right. You know, that you really do at some point need to be critical and say not every idea is a good one or good for mm -hmm. now, I should say. Right. Um, so talk to right. me about those two things. 
Well, you know, there's a difference between an idea and a person, and oftentimes people yeah. associate yes. with personality. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's me. That's a piece of me up there. Well, yeah. what tends to happen is when you start to generate those ideas so quickly, other than trying to be a handwriting analyst, you don't remember where the ideas came from. The other thing is, if you take a look at ideas and as they develop, what you might find is that, and, and if you track it back, you might get a really cool insight at idea, say, like, like 25. But if you track it back to idea 20, something kind of goofy might have come up there to lead it in that direction, something off, off, off the page. And so that idea might not get selected, but it will lead to an idea that did get selected that led to a better idea. And I like to use the analogy of a wedding photographer. We went to a wedding a couple of years ago, and it was this big wedding, and we had a great time. And there are these three photographers all over the place. And as the evening went on, I'm walking around the, uh, the event uh, center where the, where the wedding was, and I'm seeing the photographers and I'm putting together their end of the wedding show. And I said, how many pictures did you guys take? And the boss photographer says to me, he goes, about three. I said, what, about three? What do you mean three? He said, we took about 3,000. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> Like, Why? wait a minute, 3,000 pictures? Yeah. And he said, what we do is we show the bride and the groom here about uh, yeah, about 950 or something like that, about 900. They picked the top 50, all right? They said, we delete the pictures that they don't pick, all right? So, you know, 50 pictures are less than 2% of all the pictures that they took that day. Yeah. And we get, we, we get a lot more than 2% when we come up with ideas. So if you're coming up with ideas so quickly – building on those ideas quickly, you don't get that emotional attachment to it. Uh, also, by not judging them, you don't have to defend it. It's like, hey, here's another idea, here's another idea, here's another idea. And, and so you don't have all those dynamics that go along with it. So, But yeah, think of uh, ideas like photographs, like wedding photographs. <laughs> I, I, I love that. And I really appreciate what you're saying about like there's a difference between people and ideas. And I do think mm. that oftentimes in the workshops I've attended, some of the mistakes that have been made – the biggest mistake I should say that's been made is that people, the way the workshop is set up, it's you're debating people, not ideas. Uh, um, yeah. And I think part of that is lack of quantity uh, mm -hmm. so that you get attached to what's that, you know, the four sticky notes on the wall. Right. What, uh, what other ways do you have to make sure that everybody's focusing on the ideas and not each other? Because I think that's actually a huge issue. Yeah. Well, there's one key thing, and the key thing is a warm-up exercise. And we talk about some warm-up exercises in Creating a Flash, but what the reason why these brainstorming or these idea sessions all, all go awry is because the group hasn't warmed up. Just like you warm up for physical exercise, you need to warm up for mental exercise as well. Yeah. So if we structure a session, we take about the first 10 minutes and say, look, here's what we're going to work on today. But before we work on it, we're going to just do a little warm-up activity. And there's three reasons why we do that warm-up activity. First, to just tr briefly train the group in the techniques we're going to be using. Here's how you're going to behave in the group. Uh, second is to sanction the time for speculation. And I really, really emphasize this because when people come into a session, as you know, they're thinking in a certain way. I got to make this phone call. I got to talk to this person. No, we're going to put a marker here. We're not going to think that way anymore. And for the next 15 minutes, we're not going to judge. So we're sanctioning this time. And then to also create what we call a judgment-free zone. We proceed then to talk about the guidelines for generating ideas. And then we give them some fun activity like, you know, what might be all the ways to improve a refrigerator or how to get a hippopotamus out of a bathtub. That's my favorite. Um, or what might you do with 10 tons of orange jello, right? Do that for five minutes. <laughs> right? That's it. And you'll try some of these connections and stuff. Then work on the challenge at hand. And what that does is it dramatically changes the energy in the room. And as you know, you're managing energy when you do these, these sorts yeah. of things. Dramatically changes the energy in the room. People have fun with it. They laugh. Then they work on the challenge at hand. And, and we have research that, that supports it in a trained group. It's producing more ideas, being more effective. There's more laughter, more smiles, significantly less criticism around that. So, And it's funny, too, because I'll start out with my graduate students or folks that are just learning this, and they'll say, I can't do a warm-up activity with these, these corporate presidents or these army generals. Oh, yeah. They love do. stuff like that. They love it. They love yeah. it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think it's also how you frame it. And Yes. What, what I have found that if I share with people, hey, we're going to do these first so that we can warm up, um, mm -hmm. you know, so that we can get our minds thinking in that direction, they're more than willing. And frankly, everybody's looking for fun at work. I mean, come on. You got it. We're in front of yeah. people all day. But, yeah. but I really appreciate that because I, I think all too often we leap into the meat of mm. the work 
and we're not no. ready. You're not ready because you're still thinking the same way. And to your point, too, you don't overdo this thing. Five to seven minutes, that's it. Otherwise, yeah. people are going, hey, are we going to work on improving a bathtub all day? Because I'm not here for that. You know, no, you get right. the energy up and you work on the challenge at the end. Yeah. No, that's right. And I think if you set it up as, well, here's why, we're, here's the purpose, yeah. people are willing to play along. Even the kind of naysayers in the room, you just have to tell them why. Yeah, exactly. And they buy into it. And, and I love, you know, um, you know, uh, legitimate skeptics, you know, uh, well, how does this work? Well, we have research to prove it. Well, and then what happens is they experience this and they go, this has been one of the most productive sessions I've ever been in. You know, wow. Yeah. One of the things, actually, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this. I was, uh, again, talking to somebody yesterday about this and actually in a podcast I was being interviewed on and I was on the other <laughs> side of the table. <laughs> how did that feel? <laughs> so here's what I was talking. We're talking about yes, but yes, and, and yes, and yes buts and I was saying that I feel very strongly and, and I think my experience has shown that we need the skeptics we're afraid of them and we say they don't get it they don't understand they're like you know they're just naysayers but they see holes and things that we don't see so I love the skeptics and I think the mm -hmm. big mistake that a lot of us who are pushing creativity and innovation make is saying oh it should be all yes and all the time and I don't, I personally don't believe that. I think constructive conflict is key. And I'd love to get your thoughts on, on how you think about the skeptics and kind of conflict in a way that's healthy for innovation. That's beautiful. And I think that happens earlier on in the process. And when we talk about the creative problem solving process, first identify the goal you want to work on, then reframe frame the problem by asking creative questions. When you've got a good question that you want to work on, generate some ideas, then build some action plans. The skeptics come out really well in this stage of clarifying the problem. Yeah. Because when you, when you get the data out, they begin to say, well, we can't do that. We can't do that. Well, then if you just tweak that a little bit and make it into a creative question beginning with the words like how to or how might yeah. amazing things begin to happen so say somebody says what's well, going to cost too much okay how to reduce the cost right. or how to raise the money that just diffuses the whole situation it's get it gets the skeptics to get their voice heard which is really really important yes. and then you can build on this but it's put forward in a creative way it's put forward in a in a way that is energizing instead of destroying everybody's heard and they get to work on on what might be a real blocking challenge so yes. it's and important I, to do that their perspective i really believe that and i used to work with this the like the ultimate skeptic oh my gosh every I, mean, I used to get really frustrated and i would roll my eyes every time he talked and i yeah. thought i was doing it internally it turns out I was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Busted. <laughs> uh, but, but what I learned with him to do is when I would present anything, I would say, so, you know, we'll just call him Bob. So Bob, you know, help me, help me understand what challenges do you see and how would you mm -hmm. on them? And I would just mm -hmm. say it out of the gate or, Hey, help me find the holes in this. I know I'm missing something. And by doing, I mean, he made everything I did so much stronger. And so instead of fighting mm -hmm. him, I learned, it, I learned to embrace him. And it took me a little bit to get there because I used to really fight the skeptics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a mistake that we make. Well, and there's a tool that we use that we, in, in, when we're developing ideas. It's called pluses, potentials, and concerns. Mm -hmm. And so when you have an idea, you get out there, you take a look at the pluses of the idea. What's good about it? What's the potential? What might be the result if the idea or was implemented? And then what are the concerns? What are the downsides or the minuses? But they're phrased like a how-to. You overcome the concerns, the idea gets incredibly strong. Yeah, that's and so I'm back to your point, yeah, there, it works. Yeah. I love that. And, and I think that really allows all the different perspectives to come into play. And mm -hmm. I, I would venture to say that it gives people the opportunity to voice concerns, not just yes butters, but just in general to voice yeah. concerns where sometimes, particularly if there's leadership in the room, you know, you get a little bit of the yes and, a little bit of the group thing, because, you know, we're all trying to play along and we want to mm -hmm. look smart and we want to, you know, if the boss has the idea, we want to, you know, support the boss. Um, but that gives you a chance to voice those in a safer environment. Exactly right. And, and voiced in a way that's not attacking, yeah. that's not negative, but it's like, well, how to, or, you know, in what ways might we consider this or how to find out more about this? You know, somebody might say, we don't have enough information about that. Well, how to get more information about that? Oh, we can do that. Yeah. Right. So uh, say the three one more time. I really want to make the, we make sure we all hear them on the, on Montreal. Yeah. So let's see. It's how to, how might, in what ways might, and what might be all the, mm. what might be all the ways, yeah, 
Yeah. And we talk about that in the, yeah, we talked about this in the book, uh, find a page here, uh, 43, 44. Yeah. Good for you for remembering. Wow. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, and, and say the three, the, it was, what's the something, something and the concerns? What were the first? Okay. Two? Yeah. The technique is called pluses, potentials, concerns, okay. or PPC for short. Okay. And first it's the pluses. What's good about the idea? The potentials. And when you talk about the potentials, we like to use the word it might. And there's a distinction between pluses and potentials. And this is what makes this technique so strong. Mm -hmm. Pluses are what's good about the idea right now as it stands at face value. Potentials are things that might result in the future. And the concerns are the downsides of the minuses. And then we phrase those like a, a how-to so we can overcome those concerns. I really like And we that. talk about that um, on page, oh, goodness gracious here, oh, step page uh, 102, 103. <laughs> so speaking of pages, I want to dig into chapter three, ah, clarify yes. the problem. Yes. And I, this one really spoke to me because you're talking about in there about you need to solve the real problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest traps that we all fall into, all of us do, and it's that we're solving the wrong problem. Yes. So how do we ensure, I guess, how do we even know if, we're sol so try, if we have the real problem or the wrong problem? How do we even get there? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, based on my experiences facilitating about thousands of these groups, there's been one situation, only one, where the initial definition of the problem was the real definition ah. of the problem. Yeah, yeah. So, so how do we ensure that? Well, first, what we have you do is just like briefly just kind of phrase what you want to create. It would be great if, if it would be great if we increase the podcast reach of your, of, of uh, Inside Lawn Street. And, and so that's not a problem. That's a goal or a wish. All right. Yeah. Then from there, start to break it down and start to come up with, as we talked about earlier, these creative questions, a whole bunch of how to's or how mights or in what ways might. The other thing that's crucial is to challenge your initial definition by asking why. Okay. So why do you want to do that? And then create a, pro a new creative question from that. Oh, so I can do this. Well, how to do this? So there's two things back to, as we talked about earlier in generating ideas, the more ideas you have, the better your chances of getting a good idea. The more creative questions you create, the greater are your chances of getting the real issue, the real problem, right? And so once you have those, then you can push down on them just like you do with ideas and select the best of those creative questions out there upon which to generate ideas. Now, the other thing is there might not be just one creative question. There might be two or three or four. And that's beautiful because you have two or three or four different pathways to help you to accomplish your goal. And you can generate ideas under each one of those pathways to get even more robust solutions. But, and, and the other thing is too, is that not rushing to solve it. Uh, you know, spend five to 10 minutes. That's all you need just to redefine what the problem is. So let, let's use the podcast thing just as an example. I kind of want to walk sure. through it in real world. Um, unless okay. you have an example that you think really highlights it from a client. Okay, all right. Um, so let's use the podcast. So let's say that the problem I'm trying to solve is I want more podcast listeners. We don't have enough podcast listeners. Okay. We need to up our numbers, all right? right? And the problem okay. we're trying to solve, um, or the goal, I guess, is one of two. So we're saying, well, that's not really the problem we're trying to solve. So walk me through right. a couple steps of that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a technique called why and what's stopping me, okay? And so, and then what from that, we're going to create some questions around that. So why do you want to have, let me just make sure that I have this here. Yeah. Uh, I want, want to have uh, more podcast uh, listeners. Okay, so why do you want to do that? Um. Because, well, for two reasons. Uh, one is because we'd like to have sponsors and we need the numbers to be higher. And the second one is um, because we think we can impact more people if more people listen. Simply put. Okay, so, so I'm hearing a couple other challenge statements in there. How to have more sponsors, how to impact more people. Is that right? Yes. yes. Okay, good. All right, so why else do you want to increase your podcast? Listeners. Uh, yeah, because we'll get even, we'll continue to get incredible guests as with our numbers okay. going up. Um, and because it's a great also platform for us to share the IQE, our assessment, so more people okay. are aware of it. Great. Okay. So let's take that first one, incredible guests. Can yeah. you take that now and turn that into a creative question beginning with how to or how might? 
how might we continue to fill our guest slots with people who have done amazing things? There you go. How might we continue to fill our yeah. guest spot with people who have done amazing things? Okay. Then the other one was uh, re regarding the uh, the assessment. So yeah. how to? Uh huh. Um, say to how what's the how might I how might we get, get the assessment? More people aware of the assessment. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if you take a look at that. Um, You've got several more challenge statements there, creative questions, just yeah. by asking why of your original goal or wish, all right? Yeah. So what we came up with is how to have more sponsors, how to impact more people, how to get more incredible guests, how to get more people aware of the yeah. assessment. Now, let's take the other direction, okay? So is there something in there that looks kind of interesting to you that you might want to pursue? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess the part that I actually thought was interesting as I was saying it was, was about how do we get more people aware of the IQE? Because well, as you were mm -hmm. saying that, I was thinking, I don't know if that's a podcast challenge, actually, now that I say that. Bingo. There yeah. you go. And yeah, so yeah. what you've just done is you've just said, hey, you know, that might be a challenge we want to work at over here. That's not a podcast challenge. Right. That might be a whole separate other challenge. Issue. Yeah. 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 So let's play it one more time. So what, so here we go. It is how to have more. Uh, what was it again? How to uh, want to increase podcast listeners. So. Um, Tamara, what's stopping you from increasing podcast listeners? Uh, I would say lack of knowledge of how the podcast SEO slash all that works. Okay. It's very uh, behind the black curtain, unlike Google or SEO, like okay. other stuff. Yeah. All right. So now can you turn that into a creative question starting with how to or how might? Uh, how might I learn more about what makes some podcasts rise to the top? Okay. Okay. Beautiful. Okay, let's take another one. Uh, what else is stopping you from getting more uh, podcast listeners? What else is stopping? <laughs> uh, this is great, by the way. I hope I hope this is helpful. like for the audience. Like this is helpful. Like, <laughs> hey, um, real live example here. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, we can move on when we feel like we've hit it because we have other stuff to talk about. But but I, okay. I do think it's really helpful to work through it. So what else might be sure. stopping us from yeah. getting more um, lack of probably lack of focus relative to everything else that's going on in the business. Okay. Okay. So can you turn that into a creative question? Uh, how might I add more energy and focus to the podcast side of the business? You know. Yeah. Okay. One more time. <laughs> About this time people's listeners, right? <laughs> yeah. The, the listeners, yeah. They're, they're, their yeah. heads are starting to smoke. Yeah. Okay. So what else is stopping you from getting more podcast listeners? Uh, uh, lack of partnerships, um, lack of partnerships with other podcasters that can spread the word. Okay. So lack of partnerships. So how might I what? Gain more partnerships with other mm -hmm. podcasters. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 By the so, way, our podcast is actually doing very well, but I'm always looking to take it to the next level. So. There you go. Okay. <laughs> but but I, just, I just thought that when you said that, I was like, oh, that would be an easy one to walk through and see where it takes mm -hmm. us. Yes. Yeah. And, and just take a look at what we did. In wow. less than five minutes, we came up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 10 different ways to challenge your initial goal or wish or challenge. And you're saying, hey, that's, that, that's the goal, but here's a way that we can work at so we can generate wow. ideas on how to get more partnerships, how to get more focus, um, all of that, and then take that to action. So, and that was five minutes. Roger, that was great. And what I, what launch street for all of us, what I want us to really pay attention to what just happened is first of all, that, that technique applies to all of us in all yes. of us. But I, I, what I found really powerful about that very simple exercise was it made me realize that there are some things that actually can be pulled out and thought about separately and other elements that need to be specific versus just how to get more listeners, right? Mm -hmm. How to capture more market share, how mm -hmm. to launch this product. Like they're, that's almost too high level to even say. Yes. Sell. Yeah. It's like how to get more sales. Well, yeah. where, when? <laughs> right. Yeah. So that was yeah. great. And I love that you have it in the book and you do it in those workshops. So for launch, go buy the book, go do the workshops with Roger because they're really great. And, and yeah. that's so the videos too. Yeah. That's probably a little bit laborious, but I do think it's worth seeing it in action and how yeah. like, oh, and I was having these little aha moments of like, oh, well, if I thought about it differently. <laughs> yeah. That's funny how creativity works. Um, uh, that's why I love it. Yeah. Now, before we have to kind of close out, where can people go to buy the book, learn more, connect with you? Well, you can buy the book on Amazon, but you can also go to createinaflashbook.com. <laughs> But I think the best place to go would be to just go to my website, to Roger Firestein, 
R-O-G-E-R-F-I-R-E-S-T-I-E-N.com. You can buy the book there. You can look at the videos. There are 20 videos that accompany the book. They're free. Okay, so whether you buy the book or not, we hope you buy the book. Uh, you can take a look at those videos, and you can actually see this why process that we just did uh, with Tamara happening. Uh, I'll give you some tools with interviews that are people that are doing this. So, best place to go: RogerFirestein.com. F-I-R-E-S-T-I-E-N. From your clients or the people that have purchased the book, what has really resonated with them that maybe even surprised you that you didn't think was like, oh, I didn't realize that was going to be so powerful. That's a wonderful question. And I guess that kind of comes back to the nature of the book. And you have the book, and, and there's a story about this. And if we can maybe do the story, yeah. my second book that I wrote was called Leading on the Creative Edge and wrote about 20 years ago. I was due for another book. And I gave it to my dad to read. All right. Now, I, growing up in northern Colorado, my dad yeah. was a farmer. And so he's reading the book, and, and I called him, and I said, Dad, what did you think of the book? He goes, well, it's pretty good. I got 25 pages into it, then I fell asleep. Where are the pictures? It's like, <laughs> okay. All right, and that's what I did, too. Yeah. Oh, Dad, God, yeah. But the thing is, he was a visual learner, all right? I mean, he was a farmer. He visualized what was going on. And so what we've done in Creating a Flash, as you've experienced, is half of the book is beautiful pictures that really illustrate um, you know, the, the, uh, the methods, the things that we're talking about, pictures of the people that we're talking about and those sorts of things. So the thing is, is this has been, it, it makes it accessible. And, 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 and it's something I'm really pleased with. The intention of the book was you can do it in a number of ways. You can read it straight through. You can read it and use the videos in a training program, in a, in a, in a business training program, in a college university class, or you can pick it up and you can just open a page or two and say, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. Because none of the chapters are more than two or three pages. So I've been talking to people that have been that have the book, and and um, I was talking to our college president last night, and at uh, at a reception, I said, "How do you like the book?" She goes, "I love the book." She said, "I haven't had a chance to read it all the way through, but what I do, it's in my office, and when I have a minute or two, I pick it up, flip through, read a couple pages, and it gives me some new insights." So I think it's that that people can read it in bite-sized pieces. Also, people in all walks of life can read it. So, you know, people that own my favorite restaurant about five copies, you know, because they're using it there. It was just designed to be really accessible. So the thing that I'm happy about is people are reading it in little bite-sized pieces, you know, yay, you know, and That's they're great. using the stuff. So, yeah. That's one of the things I actually appreciated most about the book is it's really more of a, I almost thought of it as like a playbook. Yeah. Uh, like if I were a coach, I would just, you know, whip it out and kind of go to a page and get some insight and some knowledge and then get, get back to work versus I think oftentimes, particularly in our space, people write these big platitude books and then they sit on the wall or on the shelf. And I don't think that that's a good use. Well, thank you for that. And that's also the reason why uh, the videos to accompany the book, because I didn't want to make it a training manual. I didn't want to explain these techniques. And so what we did was we just sat, we just pulled a group of trained people together, spent a day, did a bunch of recordings of these techniques in action. And they're short seven, eight minute videos, as you know, and you can see pluses, potentials, and concerns in action. You can see the why what's stopping me in action. Yeah, I love that. So, Roger, I can't believe we're out of time, or we went over time. <laughs> Great. What's yes. your final piece of advice for innovators on Long Street? Innovators on Long Street. Final piece of advice is we touched on this a little bit earlier. Two things. One, don't talk to the same people that you always do. Get out, talk to different people. Second, read, listen, Watch different material, material outside of your area of material that's not related to your, your field at all, because in those places, that's the rich source of new connections and new ideas. That is a great place to close it on. Roger, thank you. This has been very insightful. I think also for me personally, thank you for the coaching, <laughs> but for launch as well. You. So thank you. It's been great. My pleasure. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Lawn Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Lawn Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LawnStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.